Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. We're the world's largest organization of residential and commercial property inspectors. We essentially train and certify property inspectors all over the world. And all of our online training, certification, business services, and marketing design that are online are free to our members. So we are doing an, a live online class, and it's about performing a certified home inspection according to a standards of practice. Because it's live, you can ask questions. And if you look at the top right corner of your video window, there should be a, a symbol like that, nine little white squares. If you click that, you'll be able to see the, the question button feature. So you can ask questions. Feel free. I'll try to get to all of them. And Frosty says, good morning. And I hope you can hear me and see me. Um, some logistics. You should be able to see me. Um, I can't see you. You should be able to hear me. I can't hear you. You should be able to ask questions at any time during our online live class. And that's at the top right corner. There's a little symbol there. You click that to ask questions. So, again, welcome. InterNACHI provides live online classes for home inspectors. You can come and join. It's open and free to everyone. Ask questions, have discussions. And if you miss it, that's OK. We archive all of the videos of the classes, and they're available at this URL, nachi.org forward slash webinar. So go there at any time and catch a recording and catch up on past webinars and past live classes. Again, my name is Ben. How are you? I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. If you want to ask a question, there's a little feature to do so, click a little button. That little nine square button there will get you to the feature to ask questions. And hello, Tom. Tom from Michigan is online. Um, we're going to do a home inspection. And we're going to run through all the systems and components of the home inspection. And we're going to look at the images and video taken during that home inspection. We're going to take a look at the inspection report and the report summary. We're going to take a look at some inspection tools that you could use. And we are going to observe any indications of defects that we may come across. But before that, um, you may be writing reports using this phrase. A lot of home inspectors use this phrase. No visible evidence of and then you insert the defect. Well, the last thing an inspector wants is a lawsuit in which their client alleges that the defect was visible at the time of the inspection. Most people would, mis would construe the no visible evidence phrase to mean that the defect doesn't exist. But what you really meant to convey is that you didn't observe any evidence of a defect. If an inspector says something was not visible, other people could argue saying that it is visible. In contrast, if an inspector says something was not observed, I didn't observe it, no one can really argue with that. Remember, an inspector's duty isn't to report everything visible, but rather only those defects he or she observed and deems material. So watch out using that phrase, no visible. Now what about the word evidence in that phrase, no visible evidence? Well, the word evidence suggests something that is permanent. And this is contrary to the real world where indications of a defect may exist at one time, but not at another. For example, a, a drip at a sink or a roof leak. 
or water intrusion. So instead, consider using the word indications. So what's not recommended is using the phrase, no visible evidence of, and you insert the defect. What's recommended is the phrase, I did not observe any indications of this during my inspection. And that makes it um, a little bit more clear as to your scope and your actual responsibilities as a home inspector. So let's do a home inspection together. And again, if you want to ask questions, feel free. You have to hit this button at the top right corner of your video screen. That's the symbol right now that Google Hangout is using. So you click that, and you get to the feature to ask questions. And some logistics. You should be able to see me. I can't see you. You should be able to hear me. Hopefully, you can hear me. Hello, hello. Um, I can't hear you. But you can ask questions, so we can talk. All right? So the first thing that I do as a home inspector is I go up on the roof. But I keep in mind the standards of practice. According to the International Residential Standards of Practice for performing a home inspection, you are not required to step upon, walk upon any roof surface. That's even a flat one, OK? You only go up on a roof if you're trained, I would say, and certified to do so, or if you come from the trades. But remember the standards of practice. Always keep it in mind. And you can use the standards of practice as a guide to perform your home inspection. And the standards of practice, let me bring it up here, is available online. And there are the systems. And right now, we're doing the roof system. We can start with the roof. Then we'll do the exterior. We'll move to the basement, do the heating and cooling, plumbing, electrical, and the rest of the house. So there's the roof. And here's what we are required to inspect from the ground level or the eaves. So you can inspect the roof system from the ground. Don't have to go up on the ladder. Don't have to walk any roof surface. Be safe. Number one thing in your profession is stay safe. There are a lot of hazards in our profession. One of them is getting up on a ladder. You can break your leg from one foot up if you fall off a step ladder. And we're dealing with electrical as well, and also in some environmental hazards. So we have to inspect the roof covering materials, the gutters, the downspouts, the vents, flashing skylights, chimneys, other roof penetrations, the general structure of the roof, from readily visible, accessible areas. Um, the type of roof covering we have to identify and observe any indications of active roof leaks. We have to report. If we see an active roof leak, you have to report it. So keep the standards of practice in mind. For me, in my business, this was actually part of my branding. The way I inspected reflected my brand. A brand is who you are. What distinguishes you from your competition? The one way I distinguished my business from my competitors is I carried really tall ladders and I got up on, on every roof. I was trained and certified to do so. I used safety equipment and procedures. I came from the trades. I used to install roofs for a living. Very familiar with it. That was I was able to distinguish myself from my competition. If you want to Inspect the roof, maybe using a, a tool, you can go to inspectoroutlet.com and use an inspect scope. Inspect a scope is a, an extendable pole with a wireless camera on the top and your device, computer, iPad, iPhone, um, on the bottom, in your hands, essentially. And you can inspect the roof system from the safety of the ground. So you may want to consider that to distinguish yourself from your competition. When I get up on a roof, I'm taking pictures, a lot of pictures. I do about 150 pictures just of the roof system. 
then another 100 of the exterior system. And I'm taking all of the planes and all of the surfaces. I'm identifying the materials. I'm looking for indications of defects. And there's a money shot there. I want to make sure that my client knows that I'm safely walking upon their roof to get really close to the shingles. There's my hand, always wear gloves. And then as I was walking around, taking pictures, I see a missing shingle tab. Must have just blown off. So I get real close to it. So I think in pictures of three, big pictures, medium pictures, and then detailed pictures. And I put those pictures, images, in my inspection report. Now comes roof penetrations, which also, I have, to, I have to remember that I'm inspecting not just one system, but the house as a system of interdependent parts. So one part affects another. So I'm on the roof, inspecting the roof system and components, but I'm also inspecting plumbing. This is part of the plumbing system. How does this affect the rest of the house? Well, later on, we'll notice that we've got a sink that gurgles. I'm not sure why. It could be a venting problem. And there are other planes. There's the lower roof, and I'm taking pictures of the lower roof. And I'm also taking pictures of components of the system. So we're required to inspect the ventilation, the roof ventilation. Now I'm inspecting actually underneath the roof surface and the roof structure and how it's ventilated or not. I also want to make sure that I know how many layers of shingles there are in the roof. This inspection came from the Northeast, Pennsylvania. And sometimes I'll find that the roof surface was just replaced prior to me inspecting it. But it didn't strip off the first layer. They just added a second layer on. And when you do that, you have to have other concerns, which is the fasteners mainly and the flashing. Typically, the flashing isn't installed properly when you have two layers, and the fasteners aren't going through and penetrating far enough. This one has one layer, and I can prove it. As I go down my ladder, I'm inspecting other systems and components, like the siding. It's hard to see these things from the ground. So while I'm, I take advantage of my position on the ladder and take a look at things like holes in the siding from a flag, uh, post, and they simply just put some um, silicone on top of it, and then it got dirty, and now it's an aesthetic problem, and there's holes that um, need patched up, won't last. There is a money shot. This helps me show my client what I do for their inspection and how I distinguish myself from my competition. Now I'm on a secondary lower roof. I'm doing the same thing. I tend to go all the way up to the ridge and go this way, that way, front, let's say, back or left or right, and look at the planes. And then I walk the surface. And as I walk the surface, I'm also feeling the structure, getting a good, after you do about uh, a thousand of these home inspections, you actually get a good feel of the condition of the structure simply by walking on it. You can feel it. Gutters look good, ventilation. There's flashing, step flashing. I like to take a picture to show my due diligence. I'm looking for the step flashing, counter flashing. It's installed well. There's soffit vents, so I know I have soffit and ridge vents, great. When I'm in the attic, I'll look for any problems with that. There's a masonry chimney stack, terracotta flue interior, brick with a, a cricket installed. I'm not too concerned about the, the surface rust. The cap looks good. The flashing, the counter flashing, the step flashing looks great. Well sealed. You don't have to inspect the flue, but while I'm there, I take a picture of it anyways. I'm using technology to my advantage. I'm not required to inspect the interior flue liner. I'm not a chimney expert, but often when I stick my nose in the top of the chimney, whether it's metal or masonry, I tend to see things. So. I'm going to make a comment on that if I see an observed indication of a defect. Now I'm on the ground. So I did the gutters and downspouts. And the way I do inspections is I write 
my report as I inspect. And a lot of software vendors like HomeGage, homegage.com, allows you to write the report while you walk around. And that's really good because I can't remember my inspection in detail after I come home six hours later. I write while I'm on the roof and I don't step on my ladder and get on the ground until I'm actually done writing the inspection report for that system, even with pictures and also take video as well. So here's the report. This is what is produced after I'm completely done with the inspection. And I inserted a few pictures and I have a masonry chimney stack. It's lined. I have some observations. I break it down, this system, into components. So I comment upon the chimney flashing and the chimney flue. And there's the roof. Here's the roof section of my report. A little paragraph of disclaimers, a little description of what asphalt shingles are, three tab. I reinforce that this is not a guarantee against future indications of roof leaks. Um, I actually say in the report, roofs leak. Um, just want to make sure that my client understands that this is not a guarantee or a warranty. And I break this roof system down into components, which is my estimated age, the condition, and the condition is, well, I have a defect in red. I title it, title it in red. And I put a missing cracked shingle tab in the back rear corner. It needs to be corrected by a professional. I comment upon the number of layers, the flashing, the ventilation, gutters, downspouts. And then I move on. Right? Now I'm doing the exterior. And I'm taking pictures as I think about how water moves. This is the Northeast. This is in Pennsylvania. We call it Pennsylvania. It rains a lot. So if you're in a climate that is um, rainy climate, a wet climate, um, think about how water tends to hit the roof and move. How does it move? Well, it hits the roof, hits what on the roof? Sloped roof surface, maybe a flat surface, look for ponding. And then it goes into the gutter system. Maybe there aren't any gutters. In this on this house, there are gutters and downspouts. And I want to make sure that those hundreds of gallons of water that are produced during a, a typical rainstorm is taken away from the structure of the home, whether it has a basement, a crawl space, or a slab on grade. I want that water away from the home. And I'm also explaining to my client this. This is really good stuff. And I'm looking for things that will allow water intrusion into the structure, even if it's slab on grade foundation. This basement, this house has a basement, so I'm really looking for um, getting that water away from the house. And I'm actually taking pictures of all of the things that are around the house, especially the grading, the walks, anything sloped improperly. Everything should be sloped away. And also looking at other things like emergency egress from the basement. This window is actually blocked by a half ton piece of concrete. I don't know why it's there. Um, there's the downspouts, there's vegetation, there's the siding, vinyl siding. We have brick. And we also have some parging, cement coating on the exposed foundation wall above ground. And that parging has been painted a few times and it has also cracked. If this is not a structural defect, doesn't even indicate settlement, major settlement. It's just, um, it happens a lot in this area, especially when this wet stuff, part of the foundation, the parging, gets wet through a crack. Then in the winter time, this is a cold climate, it freezes and pops. So it just needs to be parged again or recoded. But I do take pictures. For my clients who are often first time home buyers, they look at this as a major problem, oftentimes. And we know it's not as a home inspector. This is a simple, this is where your experience comes in and help your client understand what's going on. You could do this dur during the inspection while you're walking around with your client and explain things. It's great when your client is there. 
you know, their eyes. They have no idea what is a defect, what is major, and what is minor. You're there as the expert communicator to help your client understand the systems and components of the house, how they work, how to maintain them, and what is a problem and what is not. Something that they need to hire somebody to fix and something they can fix themselves. And sometimes I run out of time, which I could spend all day. I run out of time explaining these things to my clients. Love it. I love helping people. So if you run out of time and you want to say things, well, you can educate your client after the home inspection by giving them InterNACHI's home maintenance book or signing them up to a homeowner newsletter that is customized to the things that you find during your inspection. And those things are available through InterNACHI. So, more pictures. Pictures worth a thousand words. I, I believe I take a picture of just about every system and component more than once. I don't share all of those pictures in my report, only some of them, but I actually give all the images to my client. And if you need to explain a few things in your report, more than just an image, you can use InterNACHI's Inspection Graphics Library. This is an online library of thousands of 3D illustrated graphics that you can use to explain certain systems and components of the home. You can go to the foundations and let's say you want to explain um, window well water. Water is filling up in the window well. Well, we've got some graphics for that. And members can download those images and stick them in their inspection reports. That's it, nachi.org forward slash gallery. Another InterNACHI membership benefit that's free. So let's continue with the exterior. Found some painted over, damaged wood, not major. Some siding that's on the eaves that's hanging down, not major. Should be corrected though. I often use my finger to point to the things that I want to identify for my client. Instead of spending time, I think it's wasting time, using your inspection software to use circles and lines and arrows and highlighting and text. Just use your finger. I don't have time for that. Use your finger, point to it, take a picture. That's what you're looking at, right? Or get up close and take a picture. And if you're getting up close and taking a picture, make sure your hand is on it. Put your thumb on there. Put your finger on there. Tell them what you're looking at, okay? Don't waste time using arrows and circles in your inspection software. So the driveway is one of the things that we inspect. And this driveway asphalt is really old. It's cracking, pretty typical of the age. The front curb, the front walks, the sidewalks, they are typically, uh, the condition is the uh, responsibility of the homeowner. So I take a look at that. And there are trip hazards in the front. I don't want um, my old grandmother who shuffles her feet along the surface of the walk to trip on that. You should be able to, you should be able to <laughs> slide your feet across any walk and not trip, okay? That's my gauge, pretty fine. Uh, there's a deck, can't really crawl underneath it, but I wanna take a picture of the surface and then tell my client that I did as much as I could underneath the deck, underneath the porch. And I'm looking for other components of the exterior. Um, before I go on, um, I want to tell you what I do. So I go up on the roof early prior to the inspection, do my inspection, um, do my pictures, do a little video. And then um, I, hopefully my client shows up, pulls up in the driveway while I'm on the roof so I can wave to them and show them that, wow, they hired the right inspector. He's up on the roof taking pictures. I come down, first impressions are really important. Shake hands, big smile, give cards, more than one, give five, 10 away, and then tell my client the condition of the roof. And that, then I walk my client around, if they'd like, the exterior, one time around, and then I scoot them in. I let them take a look at their new home that they're in love with. And I tell them that I will be with them, and I'll show them the major systems in the house. If I find anything wrong, I'll definitely show it to you and I'll put it in the report. 
And then I go around again and again, the exterior, looking at all the systems and components of the exterior in detail, alone. But after a while, you get used to inspecting and talking at the same time. Whenever I see any standing water in some kind of garden pool or garden feature, I call it out as a potential safety hazard, especially for very small children. There's the gas meter. So this house has natural gas. It comes from the street. That's the meter. The supply line is on the left, and then it goes in to the basement on the right. It's touching the ground. It really should be elevated off the ground. And I don't know how they installed this, but they, they stalled the meter and the water faucet so close to each other, you can't get a handle on the water faucet. So you have to use a wrench to turn the water on and off. So it's an inconvenience, but um, that could be easily moved. And the shutoff valve for the gas to the house is buried underground. So that's no good either. There's the air conditioner, outdoor compressor unit, condenser unit, evaporators inside. Um, so I'm going to look for the age, the condition. I could, I could do a rule of thumb for the sizing. Just make sure nothing's whacked off, too big, too small. Oftentimes, um, it, they're really off on the size. They're oversized. Most um, older homes with air conditioner units have been sized too big for the home. And um, that's a waste of energy. And uh, I look for the refrigerant lines, the liquid line, the suction line, and uh, the electric shutoff disconnect. So that's what I'm doing, taking pictures of everything as I go. Again, I'm on the exterior of the house, but I'm looking at other components of other systems because one component of a system will affect another component of another system in the house. So while I'm looking at the air conditioner unit outside, I understand what's going on on the inside with the heating system. This shows me a lot. I know that this older home has a newer heating system. It's gas fire, natural gas, and it's what efficiency? Low, medium, or high? It's high. There's the um, fresh air intake on the left, exhaust on the right. The air conditioner is on a stable base. All of the exterior receptacles are new GFCI receptacles. And some of the tools that I use during an inspection include this little guy, um, a GFCI receptacle. This is just for GFCIs. But if you wanted to test GFCIs and AFCIs, arc fault, um, you could use one of these. So it tests, gives you a lot of information. You quantify a lot of things with this, but all I want to do is really just push the test button for the ground fault and arc fault. And um, some of the other things that I use um, is the uh, voltage meter tester to test if something is live or not. Um, and then when I get inside, this is really important, my moisture meter, um, non-invasive or you can do a probe invasive. I like to use the handheld ones. Um, and then also later on, um, I'll show you. I think I did a, an infrared scan on this house, but they are coming out with mobile devices. So this is an infrared camera that sticks on the back of my iPhone, like that. And it's an infrared camera. That's pretty handy. So as we continue, there's some Bilco doors, uh, manufactured uh, brand, Bilco. Steel doors that go down to the basement. Um, some damaged vinyl siding. Uh, looks like the dryer exhaust vent, bathroom vent. They took out a window and put that in. Electric meter, service amp, overhead conductor, service line. There's the meter line going into the home. This is an updated line. It's 200 amp go into the home. Grounding wire, observe that. Um, the overhead conductors are in the trees from the pole, the service line. Light post work, missing light fixture. Well, they 
it's missing, but maybe it's just removed. But um, they left the, the electrical box, and the shutter has been damaged. Um, they cut a circle out. And it's not really important. We don't inspect low voltage systems, but I always test the doorbell and make sure that door, it's about half of the time the doorbells don't work. So why not? Um, thermostat, identify the type of thermostat. It's programmable, nice. And um, its location and what it um, controls. But before we go to the heating system, here's the exterior report. So I throw in some pictures. Three across works good for me. Um, I point at things. I don't use any arrows or circles. And the exterior is broken down into certain components, such as the surface water management, I call it, the grading, and window wells. And then we do house wall coverings. Um, we have vinyl and brick here. We also have masonry. Um, the vinyl needs to be repaired. The masonry needs to be repaired. And then we have the driveway and parking. That needs to be repaired. The walks, there's a trip hazard. The walks are cracked. Patio, porch, deck, steps, exterior water faucets, receptacles, GFCIs. The public gas meter, that needs to be improved. Remember the valve is below the ground. Dryer vent hood, exterior door to the basement. Fences, gates, lights. The light in the front needs to be repaired. And the water pond. It could be dangerous. So um, the bird baths and things like that. Here's the heating system. What efficiency is this heating system? You should be able to tell me what the heating system efficiency is from 10 feet away without even touching it. We know this is not low efficiency because it doesn't have um, a natural draft hood on it. And it's high efficiency because, well, we have two pipes, one's in, fresh air intake, and one's out. And we have a, there's the air conditioner, condensate, condensate pump, and we have the sealed chamber and uh, a draft fan and, uh, there. So it's inducing a draft with a sealed chamber and ignition, electric ignition for the, for the pilot. And I try to take pictures of everything. That's through the, the looking glass, observed glass, um, looking glass of the sealed chamber. I want to see anything. And then I break it down into components once again. That's the shutoff valve, gas shutoff valve, drip leg, the shutoff switch, the service switch, and the sump pump is plugged in right there. And then there's the high efficiency deep pleated media filter, air filter, on the cold air return of the duct work. So you pull that out. And it's missing. So they threw it away. It got dirty. Um, they're kind of expensive, but they're high efficiency. They're really good, but they decided not to use it. And so they put in a half inch low efficiency filter, disposable, should be replaced every 30 days. This one's actually clogged and bowing in because it's so um, clogged. And they actually have new filters right there, right next to the heating system. So they could have installed it, but they didn't. And I take pictures of all of the service labels, the manufacturing labels that are on the systems, and also the service. I want to tell my client the last time this was serviced, or the record of the service, the date, and what was done, by whom. Here's a humidifier, whole house humidifier. It gets dry in the wintertime. It's humid in the summertime. So it's turned off in the summertime with the duct. And there's the evaporator filter. The filter gets wet, air passes through it. That humid air then goes through the system and is distributed throughout the house through the ductwork. There's some foil and some insulation, um, foam insulation and some fiberglass insulation stuffed in the holes where the um, high efficiency pipes go through the home, the band rim joists. And they're strapped well. And that's about it for the heating and cooling system. Works pretty good. In my report, I title it heating or heating system. I identify the system, gas-fired forced air. Little for your information details. Um, describe the heating system and components. It breaks it down to the thermostat, electric shutoff switch, gas shutoff, gas burners, 
air filter. Air filter needs to be um, attended to. The humidifier, the service record has been serviced in a long time. Every heating and cooling system needs to be serviced every year. Um, inspection restrictions and estimated age. That's what's in the report. The cooling is broken down, heating and cooling. And pictures, general information. Um, it's level, but it needs to be monitored. There's an electric disconnect. The operating sound is normal, as expected. Estimated age. And then the interior evaporator unit. And the condensate is handled well. So no problems there. Any questions? Any questions so far? Cool. Everyone's good? You want to keep going? Cool. Um, let's see. Maybe. Did I forget? While I'm going, I think. Let's see if I have. Let's see if I can pull this. So this is the actual, I forgot. The actual shingle roof. So I forgot that um, I was talking about I do a video of the roof, but I forgot to show it to you. So this is what I do. I go up on the roof, and I take a video. Sorry, I'm going backwards a little bit. Forgot about the video of the roof. And there's the, me identifying where that shingle tab is missing on the roof. I don't want my client going up on a roof, so I do a video of the roof. Often I do a video of every system and component of the home, especially when the house is vacant and I don't have my client. I take a little time, do a little video, and send that video to them. But for this client, what I did was at the end of the inspection, in the kitchen, I um, opened up the video and I turned my computer around to them and I played the video and I asked them to watch it, especially with their agent or agents um, over their shoulder behind their back watching this video. And they look at it for a while and they realize, wow, that's my roof. You took a video of my roof. Yep. And they're really happy about that. They actually understand the condition of the roof that you're trying to communicate in words and images a lot better with video. And anybody nowadays can do video. And I know there's one, at least one, um, software company, HomeGage, that allows you to embed video into your software report, web-based software report. So I would take video as much as you can. It helps communicate the condition of the home. And it's also that shock and awe effect where you turn your computer around and you play the video for your client and they realize, wow, you're really good. And that helps you with your brand as well. This is one of my things that I use to brand myself, to distinguish myself from my competition. I get up on the roof, you don't have to, you're not required according to the standards. I get up on the roof and I take video of my inspection and that is free. I add it to my inspection service. I provide incredible value to my clients. The more value you provide, the more, um, the greater profit opportunity there is. So um, this is the sewer lines. This is cast iron. So again, this is northeast. Um, they do cast iron sewer drain vent pipes. So I'm taking a look at the cast iron condition. They often crack. Um, here is a hairline crack in a cast iron pipe. Um, sometimes if, uh, if, the, if there's an opportunity, um, I'll get my screwdriver and see if how big or how deep that crack is. Sometimes it's just surface because they actually fold the cast iron and meld the two seams that way, long ways. And that's where the crack tends to develop. And I also take pictures of inspection restrictions. I can't see everything during the inspection. So there's a lot of pipes that are hidden behind the finished parts of the home. This is in the basement. I go directly to the basement. Roof system, exterior, basement. And we have one question. Brett asks, do you write down serial numbers? No, not required to, um, according to the InterNACHI standards of practice. In your state, you may be required to, but I don't write them down. I certainly take a picture of it, though, and I keep it for my records. 
Um, so getting back here, there's the water coming in. So what do we do? Roof system, exterior, then I go down in the basement or wherever the heating system is. I go to the heating, the cooling, and now I'm doing water in and then drain out. So that's how I think about it. And as I do each system, I know that I'm inspecting this home as a system of interdependent parts. These, you affect one system of a home and affects all others. So as I'm looking at the water coming in, I'm also thinking about water going out. So we did the sewer and drain. Now we're doing water supply. Water comes in from the, the street, underground, shutoff valve, shutoff valve, water meter, jumper, move on. Hot water source. I know it's a hot water tank. We have natural gas coming to the house, so I'm assuming that that gas is also supplying the hot water source, and there it is. It's a natural draft hot water tank, and there's the chimney. I know the heating system didn't use the chimney, or it did before, but it's not now because it's high efficiency, the vent pipe, fresh air intake and exhaust are out on the outside of the house. So what's the chimney for? Fireplace? Didn't look big enough. So it was a uh, square, small diameter um, size flue. So it was for one of the heating systems, hot water tank. There it is, natural draft hot water tank. Take pictures of everything. It's um, not an FVIR tank. If you don't know what that is, you should take our course about hot water tanks. Um, shut off valve on the cold water line coming in. There's the picture of the, all the serial numbers and the, the size and the TPR valve is dripping at the end. So there's something up with the TPR valve, temperature pressure relief valve. It's leaking, and they had a nice little jar there to catch the leak. And the flue pipe connection, the connection going into the chimney, masonry chimney. And there is a clean out. And so I stick my camera in the clean out. And I take a picture of the flue. I don't have to. I do it. I, I don't, no one, no home inspector is required to take to inspect the interior flue liner of any chimney, metal, masonry, plastic. But I do it, because oftentimes I see something, there are observed indications of things. So the structure of the chimney is good, and here's the report. is the plumbing system. Drain waste vent pipes, the type of material, the condition of the pipes, public water supply, Water shutoff valve, water meter, jumper cable, water supply pipes, description, gas water heater, some for your information. I comment on the size, the age, the water shutoff valve, gas shutoff valve, the vent pipe, the relief valve, the discharge, and there's no water leak catch pan. I don't like a water leak catch pan anywhere under the, under the hot water source tank. I don't care if it's in the basement or the garage. Put it catch pan underneath it. And there's the laundry. Laundry tub, laundry legs, drain pipe. You can see the inspection restrictions. I'm having a lot of problems. Everything is really covered up. I mean, I can try to inspect that. I, I can try to describe my inspection restrictions like that with words, but a, a picture is worth a thousand words. So these pictures really help explain what I'm doing, what I can see, what I can observe, what indications are available to me. So the basement is partially finished and just filled with a lot of inspection restrictions. I measure the floor joists. I'm looking for cuts, board holes, damage, anything that damages the wood structure I'm looking at for, particularly water intrusion. But I'm also documenting with all these images. I do about another 150 just in the basement. 150 images on the roof on average, 100 on the exterior, another 150 in the basement. I'm documenting all the inspection restrictions like drop down ceilings. And then as you're taking pictures of all these things, even if it's just a general picture of the room and then you go close up, I tend to stumble over almost. I discover a lot of defects. Thank goodness I was taking pictures. Sometimes my camera is the lead 
in this inspection process. Because I wanted to take a lot of pictures, so I'm wanting, desiring to take a lot of pictures, and I tend to take a picture of something that pops up. Because I have to focus on it and grab it and identify it. And here's a, a live wire, a uh, dead wire, I wouldn't touch it. A dead wire just hanging in there. It could be on a breaker. Maybe the breaker's off. Could be live at a, in, the, in the future. So it's, it could be a defect. It is a defect. You can't have wires just hanging out like this from a box. There's a trip hazard. And then there's the sump pump. So this home has, has indications of water intrusion and they have a sump pump, but it's not professionally installed. Poor workmanship is a phrase that I use. And this pump is going to fail prematurely because it's, it's sitting in mud and it's gonna suck all that mud up. It should be in a sump pump bucket. It takes a lot of effort to install one of these, but when you need it, it needs to work really well and it needs to be reliable. This is unreliable. So this pump needs to be re replaced and reinstalled professionally for it to be reliable. And we do have conditions of water intrusion, active water penetration, right there. So now I'm kind of bending over, looking around things that are stored and bumped up against the wall, looking at the finished wall surfaces, the bottom corners, the nooks and crannies. I'm really getting in there with my nose and with my camera. And if I have a moisture meter or an infrared, I'm gonna stick that down there. And I'm taking pictures of now the floor. Not only the wall has watermarks, but the floor has watermarks as well. And I don't use evidence because that means that the, if it's not wet, I had one real estate agent try to tell me if it's not wet, it's not a problem. Nope. If it's a dry watermark on the floor, that could be wet tomorrow. That could have been wet this morning. For me, a dry watermark is considered like an active problem. Unless somebody can show that it just wasn't mopped up. All of the water was taken care of. A new drainage system was installed. And we just didn't wipe up the watermark on the floor. It's been there for years. Right. Sure. So there's um, extendable. I had an extendable. Um, no, they no longer make these. It's an extendable pole. It's a moisture meter. It's essentially this on a stick with the probes. So if you find one, that'd be great. But I haven't been able to find one. So I just pulled that out. I, when I come to the front door, I bring my um, tool bag, and that includes a lot of things, the infrared camera, the moisture meter, that moisture probe, and all my other things, the level, and stuff like that. So I'm probing around. It doesn't quantify anything. I'm a generalist, not an expert. You never want to be an expert in the home inspection business. You want to be a generalist. An expert is a legal term that opens you up, exposes you and your business to a, lot, to a higher standard. I want to stay within the scope of a home inspection and run my successful home inspection business and make it very profitable. And one of the things that I do is I stay within my scope. I don't quantify anything, right? I don't measure anything. It's qualification. It's not quantification, it's qualification. I look for anomalies, look for observed indications of defects. Okay, this is the basement. Oh, this is a three-tine hoe. They still make these. The extendable pole goes out to four feet, collapses down to two. It's really for gardening. Three-tine hoe. Um, I bend the fingers so that one is really curved, one is slightly curved, and one is straight. So that I can hook things, I move insulation, and then I can put it back. I can probe things, I can pound things. I'm looking for anything that destroys wood within the scope of a home inspection. I look for anything that destroys wood, and that is mold, moisture, and bugs. I don't identify bugs, but I, but I could help my client if it's damaging wood. I could help my client. Here's one of the things that InterNACHI provides. We publish this. This is a, a field guide, a complete field guide to wood destroying insects. And um, it's laminated, so it's a field guide. It's protected, UV protected and water protected. And it helps you um, communicate your observations. 
So here's a um, picture of a termite, if you see something like that, or if you see things like that and you're trying to help your client understand what you are observing, subterranean termite. What's the difference between um, a termite and a carpenter ant in relation to the antenna? Which one is elbowed or clubbed? The subterranean termite or the carpenter ant? Which elbow, which one has a, an elbowed antenna? Here's some old, old house borer holes. Um, the actual bugs themselves. And you can describe your client, oh, this is exactly what I see. See, there's a carpenter bee on the, the eave of your house in the wood trim, and it's boring a hole. And this is exactly what is going on here. And you'll be able to describe it. The carpenter ant has the uh, elbowed antenna. The subterranean termite has straight antenna. All right. Any questions? Oh. Chuck asks, uh, what camera are you using? Your iPad, iPhone, or camera? I love Canon camera. I don't have one with me. Canon is really nice. They used to make really fa I get the old ones. They're like 49 bucks now. Because I have um, these hands, I need to grasp something. It's very difficult for me to hold something that looks like an iPhone as a camera. I don't know. And, you know, I like the big buttons. I'm old school. I need something to hold in my hand and grab onto it and push a button. So that's what I use. It's physically take out the flash card, stick it in. Old school. But nowadays, you know, I, if you can, use your iPhone to do imagery and video. Yep. On the fly. And... Um, Again, the, the infrared that FLIR makes is really good. I believe they're coming out with one for Droid, um, Droid device, um, Android devices. Um, and also, they have an infrared camera that isn't attached to a phone. It's just this size. I think it's called a C2. So take a look at FLIR. They're, FLIR and Fluke are, are really pushing the envelope. Um, let's see. Tom asks, do you operate water and gas valves if they look old? <laughs> Absolutely not. It's a great question. Very good questions, fellas. But no, I do not touch or operate water valves. If the water, if the utilities are off, it's off during my inspection. I charge for my time. They should have had it on. I don't turn water valves on. I've had agents then say to me, well, I'll turn it on. And I said, oh, go ahead. Turn on the valve for me. Sure. And it's never worked out. So I never turn on valves. I never test valves. I never try them out. Um, nope. It never works out when you do that. Um, and Tom asks, is the book on Inspector Outlet? Yep. So go to inspectoroutlet, one word, dot com, and um, you'll find everything you need um, to be a successful home inspector, all the tools and also the, the textbooks and PDF downloads, and uh, go there for everything that you need to do an inspection. Got the cool tools there. Okay, um, so here's the report. For, here's the part of the report for the structure. A lot of pictures. I open up with a lot of inspection restrictions. That's where I describe, you know, I can't see everything. So, um, I break down the structure into the type of structure. So I have a full basement. I have a basement restrictions. It's a concrete block foundation. I identify the floor type and condition. The electrical components are part of this section of the report. Any observed indications of water penetration? And there are. And the sump pump has problems. Electrical. So. I identify the service coming in on the main disconnect if it's labeled, and then I take a picture of my hand on it, and two fingers is 200 amps, one and a half, 100, and then 60, you know, no good. And every breaker should be labeled. We don't have every breaker labeled here. And there's a ground fault breaker, so I tested that. That works. 
There's one breaker that I identified prior to my complete inspection, prior to even touching the panel, as being turned off manually. It wasn't tripped. It was a turned off. Whether it's tripped or turned off, don't turn it back on. Okay? Just identify it. So I identified it as a problem. Maybe, remember that electric line that was hanging down and the unfinished electrical uh, components in the basement? Maybe that breaker is on that. Don't know because the breaker wasn't even identified. You do not have to remove the dead front cover. If you do, wear PPE. Protect yourself. Goggles. Never, never open up an electrical panel and remove a dead front cover without PPE. Personal protection. You have to have gloves on. You have to have goggles on. Don't even take training from an instructor who doesn't use PPE during the inspection. Terrible, terrible. You have to protect yourself. Safety is number one. One thing you got to do is work within the scope of your inspection. You do not have to remove the dead front cover. You do not have to do, you have to walk on a roof surface, for example. Okay? If you exceed the standards of practice, you have to do it well. You have to do it for all of your clients, not just one or two or here or there. And we have um, an opinion, a written opinion, about exceeding how you exceed the standards of practice as a home inspector. And you have to do it in the right way. We have a written opinion by our legal counsel. So I can forward you that letter. Um, it's actually an article that's online, readily available. You do not have, so don't, don't take the front, dead front cover off. I did on this one. And I'm glad I did because we have water penetration to the interior of the electrical panel. Really bad. Can't have water and electricity. Everything else looked okay. Didn't find any problems with the electrical panel. And there's my report section, starting with the outside. The electrical system, I kind of put everything together in the report that has something to do with the electrical system. So even though the meter and the lines are located on the outside of the house, and I inspected that about an hour ago, it's in the electrical report section. Uh, I put it all together. So I follow the electric su supply from the outside to the meter to the panel through the disconnect. Yep. Laundry. I'll go faster. Um, the hoses should be um, stainless steel braided mesh hoses so they don't explode in the middle of the night or when you're on vacation. Um, ground faults near the, ground faults in the laundry are needed. Um, that's part of the report there. And then I do bathrooms. When I get to this part, I'm moving faster now. Bathrooms are easy, interior is easy. I'm moving through pretty fast and I get to the kitchen, which is really important. I do the kitchen last because that's where I'm set up and that's where we're gonna talk. That's where we sit down at the coffee table for an, a half hour or so and talk about the condition of the home, what needs to be repaired immediately, what are hazards, what are monitoring issues, what needs to be repaired by the homeowner after you move in, things like that. So I'm moving through. So we'll move through fast. The attic, if you have access to it, got to inspect it, and I want to inspect the underside of the roof surface that I was walking on prior. We know it's well ventilated. It has 10 inches of fiberglass bat insulation with a vapor barrier on the drywall side. It's northeast coast, cold climate. But there are gaps in the insulation. And when there are gaps in the insulation, that means it's, there's a, it's like a, having an open window, essentially. Air is moving up through these older homes, right up through the, the stud walls, maybe from the basement. There's a natural draft that happens in a home, a building, commercial or residential. It's a natural house stack effect, they call it, where air is sucked in, essentially, in the lower parts of the, of the house that are not sealed. It moves up naturally and escapes outwards on the second floor, third floor, attic space, and it carries with it dirty air. And if it's not sealed, air sealed, it's gonna come right through and go right through the fiberglass. We call it filter glass. Fiberglass does not stop air. 
it filters it. So here we have open gaps in the insulation, and you could see the dirt on the sides of the fiberglass insulation from the dirty air. It's not mold. You ever open up um, unfaced fiberglass from a ceiling when you're in the attic space and you look at the underside of the fiberglass and there's black lines? It's probably not mold. It's probably unsealed drywall seams where the studs and the top plates are and air is escaping up through and carrying dirty air and being filtered by the fiberglass. That's part of um. If you want to learn more about energy efficiency, and that's an energy efficiency issue because when a house has a stack effect and air is escaping, that's conditioned air escaping. When you are bleeding conditioned air, you're bleeding energy and you're losing money as well. And you can help your clients understand that concept and it's very um, affordable to fix. They make an initial investment on sealing and air, air sealing and insulating their home, especially in the attic. And that initial cost is essentially paid for itself by the savings, the energy savings down the line. So the structure looks good, trust built. There are inspection restrictions. There's the chimney stack on the lower part. There's electrical problems, unfinished electrical work in the attic, that's a hazard. Some kind of fan is going on with a switch. Homeowner installed that, not professional, hazard. There's um, a smaller access door, small access door to uh, um, the lower part. Remember, there's a lower roof and there's an attic underneath that section. Well, the access door is not insulated. It's not sealed with a weather, weather strip seal. It's essentially an open window, uninsulated open window. There's a quarter inch kind of like foam, rigid foam panel installed on there. But it is, um, it, in the summertime, that door is hot. It's red hot in the wintertime. That warm conditioned air from the home is just blowing through. It's like an open window. People on the second floor are probably uncomfortable, and the heating bills are probably excessively high, and the cooling bills as well in the summertime. So that needs to be improved. And then there's the section of the report. Not much going on, except the attic access needs to be improved, and the electrical wiring needs to be attended to. So we're doing bathrooms going through, looking at all the systems and components, run water, um, there's vinyl flooring, um, the vinyl is stained, that's because water has gotten underneath the vinyl at the corner where the tub meets the wall, um, common problem. Um, plumbing access panels, I wanna see a plumbing access panel for every tub and shower. If it isn't there, I'm gonna call it out. Because when I open it, I tend to find stuff, like small drips that no one knows about. I do the windows, the doors, representative sampling. The smoke detectors are really old. When you have a battery-operated smoke detector that's yellow, it really should be replaced. And uh, wrinkles in the carpet, the fan wobbles, the windows open and close. Some of the doors are damaged, been kicked in. Um, the fan wobbles there, it's fallen off. Um, looking at bathrooms, whenever I see carpeting in the bathroom, you really shouldn't have any carpeting in the bathroom. You should have all hard surfaces. When I see carpeting, I tend to pull it back. I want to see what's underneath the carpeting, especially where the, where the water leaks are, which is where the tub meets the floor and the wall. Same thing. I, I actually squirt water, if I can, with the handheld shower fixture at the corners and I go on the outside and see if it leaks. They often do, and then I also push on the tiles. I pound on the tiles. I look at the grout lines. I see what's going on. If you ever replaced your own bathroom tiles, you know what's going on here. You really want a nice hard knock. You don't want anything soft. And oftentimes, my hand has gone through. And that's a good thing. Whenever I damage something, that means I found a defect that no one else could find, and I take a picture of it. I'm pretty proud of it. So don't worry if you're pushing on something or holding on to a bar, a safety bar that's supposed to hold 200 pounds and it doesn't, right? I, I tend to test things that are supposed to be tested, especially a railing. Railing, handrails, are supposed to hold a lot of weight in any direction, 200 pounds in any direction. Well, if it falls over, yep, I broke it, but I tested it. It was supposed to hold. Don't, don't freak out if you happen to break something. Like, 
you tested the ground fault and it doesn't reset. Great, you discovered a defect. So I took a lot of pictures. I want to show you that I took a lot of pictures. The stairs actually are not up to modern standards for stairs. Um, ideally, like 11 inches for a tread and 7 inches for a rise. This one is actually 8 inches for the tread and 8 inches for the rise. Boom. It was steep, steep slope there. So um, the railings really need to be installed because um, it's very steep. Drywall cracks in the ceiling, taking pictures, especially the ceiling below a bathroom. I always take a look at that. I always look up and look at the ceiling below a bathroom, second floor bathroom. And uh, the rest of the house, pretty good. Not many pictures for the interior. Bathrooms, the ground faults, they're all, you know, they all need to be replaced. And um, we want plumbing access panels and the doors are damaged and the Ceiling fan wobbles, and the steps are not to modern code. Could be a trip hazard. Go in the kitchen, run water. It's leaking there. Always take a picture underneath the sink. You don't know how many times I've found a sink that looks great on the top, and then when you look underneath, man, that overflow has been rusting for 10 years, and it's about to give. And you stick your thumb right through the rust, and now it has a problem. So the ground faults here are really bad. Um, there are receptacles actually behind the stove. There's a lot of um, renovation going on, um, but not by a professional. Um, the refrigerator was actually plugged into a ground fault. Uh, dishwasher, um, the sink gurgles, the kitchen sink gurgles. Not sure why. Don't have to uh, diagnose it. I just have to uh, uh, report the observed indications of a, a problem here at the sink. Stove turns on, oven door hits the wall, um, there's the microwave, it has been cracked, the microwave has a crack in it, I turned it on, little microwave detector you can get from inspector outlet, um, just lights up when it um, is bombarded by microwaves, shock and awe kind of thing, and then um, that's about it. So one of the things that I put in the report is, I don't know if you can read it, under the lights, it says, the light is functional, but the client doesn't like the way the switch turns off. Hey, my client wanted that in the report, and I stuck it in the report. I didn't say, I don't like it. I said, my client doesn't like the way the light switch doesn't turn off. There was really nothing wrong. But, you know, I work for my client. Report summary is basically all the things that need to be monitored, repaired, or corrected. Correction is, you need a professional. Repair, you can probably do it yourself as a homeowner. And monitoring is that there's a condition, it might change in the near future. Not sure. Take a monitor it. There's a report summary. And I print that out as fast as I possibly can at the end of the inspection so that my client can start to take action. That's what they really want. They want me to be professional, certified professional inspector. They want a good inspection. They want me to find stuff that's there. And they want the report results really fast. So I print out a report summary. They can take action. They start negotiating. And then I provide them the full inspection report later. You can do it from your home office, your office, your van, your truck, your vehicle. Or um, you can do it right there. I often ask my client if I have time, would you like the entire report printed out or sent to you? I can do it right now if you'd like. And they let me, and so I do it. You have to figure out what works for you. But this, providing a summary report um, was OK in my state. I can provide a summary report. I can actually give estimates uh, if they were in a range in my state. And um, uh, that's what I did for my clients. And it actually was part of my branding. So I told my clients, my potential clients that are trying to figure out if they should hire me or not, that they will get a summary report right after my visual inspection. All right, that was our live online class. Oh, and we have questions. So let's see, what do we have? Robert asks, hi, it looked like the soft vents were covered with insulation. Did I see that correctly? Yeah, yep. So I, we can go back and take a look. Um, sometimes um, you have to pay attention to the vents. So there was actually a, a gable vent in one of the lower attic spaces. 
I didn't go over that, but there was a window. So that was open as well. Um, and the soft events need trays. So you need, ideally, I like to look for on a sloped roof, um, half and half, right? Half of your events are on the eaves and you got a ridge vent. So awesome call, awesome call. We can take a look. I better look in the inspection report, see if I actually wrote that down. Uh, another question. Frosty says, we seem to have quite a few half basements here in Canada. Have you ever run into them, and how far do you go inspecting the crawl space area of these basements? I go all the way in. If this was my best friend's house that they're buying, my wife's house, my mom's, my sister's, so I would go in all the way. That's how I inspect it. As if this was my own home. I want to know everything, so I go all the way in. That means I bring to the front door in my bag a crawl space suit and different shoes. So I go in a crawl space with different shoes so I don't come out all muddy with my shoes on and walk through the house in the same shoes. Different shoes and a full canvas um, bodysuit. I like the canvas ones. Not really into the Tyvek white ones. It looks too scary. It appears like I'm doing some kind of environmental testing with the hoodie thing, and it's it's really good protection. But I like the canvas ones. It looks like I'm a worker. Canvas, like a Carhartt, something from Carhartt or something, you know, with pockets that zip, so that when I'm in the crawl space, things don't fall out of my pockets. Nice, good pockets, and I wear um high efficiency breather mask, three quarter face. I don't protect my eyes with a, a, a air mask. I protect my eyes with goggles. They're separate. I tend to need to open up my goggles, but keep my air mask on. And I wear a hat, I wear gloves. If you go to inspector outlet, there are actually crawl space gloves. Didn't have them when I did inspections, they have them now. It's a glove that goes all the way a little bit past your elbow and it's protected on this side of your, so you can crawl like this. And then if you check out our InterNACHI monthly newsletter, there's an advertiser, Crawl Gear, and you put the wheels, you lay down, and you put this, you lay down on four balloon tire wheels, and you crawl, and you pull the rest of your body weight on wheels, and you crawl around. That's what I would do. And I charge for that. I make sure that my potential clients who are visiting my website know I go in there all the way and know that I can fit in any crawl space attic and I walk the attic, you know, and um, I go all the way in. And when I'm in there, now I've got my tools. I have my voltage meter, right, voltage tester. Um, I don't tend to take my infrared camera in that dangerous place, but I'll take a moisture meter and I'll also take something I can probe with, a stick. A long, I used to carry a, uh, a two-foot screwdriver. Go to Home Depot or Lowe's or something. Get the longest, strongest screwdriver. Boom, 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 so you can probe. Okay? And that's what I do. I go all the way in. Um, did I answer your question? Yep, I think so. And half basements are really cool. Like a you know, you have a finished lower basement. It's like a split level, right? You walk in the front door and there's downstairs or upstairs. And downstairs, you go to a finished basement. You turn and you go underneath the first floor over here, the upper floor. And that's where the crawl space is. And that's awesome stuff in there. Once you do like a 1,000 or 2,000 home inspections, you get excited about difficult homes. So I look forward to going into the dirtiest, most difficult parts of the home and finding those things that no other inspector could find. And then, a uh, little marketing tip, if you want to use a Facebook page, um, grab an image that you took, make sure it um, doesn't show a whole lot of personal things, make it non-confidential. An image of a defect that you found during an inspection, you upload that image on your Facebook page, you write three sentences about what you found. This is what I found, this is the condition, and I'm the only inspector in this area that could have found that. And you do that every day. You upload things. And you keep your Facebook page, excuse me, updated. And um, 
That's part of the home inspection business course that InterNACHI offers, how to run a successful home inspection business. And we include everything, like how do you use a Facebook page? How do you social network yourself into success? And so I also recommend this. This is a, a book. It's available as a, a print book and also as a PDF. The PDF version is free if you go to, right now, um, if you go to nachi.org, the homepage of Nachi, InterNACHI, is nachi.org. And right now, um, we have available for you this book in PDF format for free as a free download. Just enter your email, and we email you the book. And so, um, but the book is really nice to have, so you can write in, in it as well. And it's titled How to Run a Successful Home Inspection Business, written by Nick Ramico, my brother, founder of InterNACHI. All right, I think that's our class. If you have any questions, um, you can go to um, our contact page or go to the web URL, website, nachi.org forward slash webinar and register for the next live online class. Or if you missed a class, you can look at the archived videos of those past classes and webinars that we have. All right, I don't see any more questions. My name is Ben from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. See you next time. Bye, everybody.